Okay, so it's a little bit past time, and I know everyone likes to chat, and uh, so I gave you a couple extra minutes, but we better get started. Good morning, and uh, I hope that you're ready to get into a really great lesson today, because, well, it's uh, the love lesson, that I always call it, and I love the book of Luke. I always think because Luke was a physician, I just always think that he is a little bit more humanly connected with how he, his wording is and how his um, just understanding of people. And uh, so I really enjoy that. Shall we bow our heads quickly before we get into the word? I thank you, Lord Jesus, for this morning, for the sunshine and the beauty that you've given us. I thank you for giving us your holy word as we can study and just the opportunity to come together with our church family and, and to believe that we know that just the love that we have for each other and the love we have for you and that we can share that love with others. How important a lesson uh, and just all the way around the, the best that we can be for you. We want to be able to have the courage to practice that and and today, may the Holy Spirit be here in this room and in this building that he will lead and guide us to, to look for what you have ahead for us. We thank you and we praise you. Amen. The lesson today is, of course, neighborly love. And I'm wired for sound, not because I normally need it, but because um, when would they do the... Uh, to, uh, the DVDs and so forth, it doesn't come across very well if we don't use a type of microphone. So it's good to see everyone this morning. And I just thought, when I was studying this lesson, what a year that we really need to look into neighborly love. I mean, there's a lot of people struggling this year. There's a lot of people struggling financially and spiritually and just struggling with depression and uh, worry. Um, you can use all kinds of wording, but it, it's been a tough eight, nine months now. I was teasing somebody the other day, you know we could have had a baby in all this time that it, we've had to sit and struggle. And I think it would have been easier because it, it's been tough. It's been tough. And you look at other people and you say, you know, how do you help these people? Well, Luke gave us a really good lesson. And there's a couple of things that I really want you to think about, and not just for ourselves, but because we have the opportunity to help other people. A lot of times, God will allow us to be in a situation, bring people into our life that we may see only one time. And in that one time, that might be their only chance to hear about Christ to hear about his love. And I know that sounds strange to some of you, but I've been in that situation, and I'm sure if I polled some of you, you would have been in that situation also. You were just at where God wanted you to be at the place and the time that someone needed an extra set of ears. Maybe they just needed to talk to you. Maybe they needed to talk to someone. Going back, I just want you to also remember that I think sometimes we live in a society that really makes us each feel unworthy. And because of that, it's sometimes hard for us to help other people because we don't feel like we're worthy, that we can do that, that we're not, you know, we're not trained to talk to people. But in this lesson, you're going to find out that if you truly love God, if you truly know Christ, you already have that training because you know what that love is. And because we were saved by grace, by the blood of Christ, that's all we really need to know to help other people is to be able to be there for them and give them that. Uh, I think it, those of, that have had me in regular class, now I have a thing about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and uh, how I, you know, perceive them. <laughs> but it, it's true, you know. It's, I can only imagine them coming to Christ. I can see the Pharisees in their long black robes and in their 
ornate, added, what they added to those robes and everything. And their snide manner of saying to Christ, well, just who are our neighbors? And of course, thinking that Christ would answer them, Jews. But that's not what Christ said, is it? It is not that. There's more than just the people that we are, whether it's the color of our skin or the beliefs that we have. That's not just the people. And I'm sure that Pharisee was not at all happy with Jesus' answer. And as you know, if you've studied and studied the beginning of the end for Christ those last three and a half years, you know how the Pharisees dogged him and dogged him because they didn't want to accept him. They didn't want to give up their power. But that's a story for another day. So let's look here in Luke 10. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I want you to realize, too, that remember, the Pharisees and the Sadducees did not believe that Christ was the Christ, okay? That's why they refer to him as teacher. Now, that's my understanding. They did not, and they didn't want to accept him for the man that he was, for the, the person that he was, the deity that he was. He was Christ, the Son of God. And so here they are asking him, teacher, what must I do to, interno, to inherit eternal life? And remember, too, that they were thinking, as we go through here, that the other part of that question is, well, do good works get me to heaven? You know, to put it in the language that we could understand and that we've heard discussed over our years. What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And... Love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. The loving of others is the important part here that we want to look at. I just want to move on to the next set of scripture and then we'll come back. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. And I'm sure all of you have probably heard this story from the time you were little in Sunday school class about the Good Samaritan and so forth. So the thing is now that we're a little older and we can get a little more understanding, first of all, the first one was the priest and he didn't want to be bothered. Now there is some background that would say, okay, that's all right, because they were not to touch on clean things. Okay, under their law and their guidance, that's, that was the way it was. They were not to get unclean. So we'll give the guy a bit of a break. The Levite passes by. You know, I can just imagine in my mind, I'm sure you can too, watching them go way around, you know, as they, they look over there from, a, oh, no, don't want anything of that, and move on. And that's the way it was, and that's what they did. Again, they were thinking they were fine doing that, okay? Oh, and a little history lesson for those of you that uh, want to know where the Samaritans came from. I, I found this interesting. Um, the Samaritans, I hope I have this right, when Assyria took over the northern part of Israel and they left some Israelites there, and then they took some to Babylon, okay? Well, other people came in to Israel, northern Israel, into the northern kingdom, and they intermingled, mixed and married with 
uh, the Israelites, and that's where these Samaritans, and if you go back, they have an amazing, very, I think, violent culture that uh, they had. But these Samaritans were considered unclean when the Israelites that were in um, exile in Babylon came back to the northern area of Israel. These, those Israelites who hadn't mingled with any others, you know, they had an attitude about, well, we're so much better than you. And they, that's why they always felt that the Samaritans were not clean. They were not acceptable to be around, and so if, uh, remember the woman at the well, I believe, I believe was a Samaritan woman, and uh, you know, again, Christ was condemned for even, A, talking to a woman, because I wasn't done back then, and B, B, it was a Samaritan woman on top of it, so that really, you know, was a big no-no. So that's how, when you look at these things, you have to remember, their culture then was their culture, just like we have our culture now, and certain things were acceptable and certain things weren't, and some were worse than others, and, and uh, here we are with this Samaritan on top of it that, you know, that he was uh, beat up. It's also my understanding, to give you a little bit of history, this um, from Jerusalem to Jericho is a pretty good footpath trip. But I think, and I think I might have this right, I never get the J words right, but Jerusalem is on a much higher ground. Am I right, Pastor Ron? And it, I think so. I think it's like, I want to say 28,000 feet high from sea. And the reason I try to remember that is because up where I live, you know, I'm on the high ground. And then you travel down, travel down this really bad, nasty uh, pathway because there's a lot of rocks, and it's not, it's not like walking down, you know, the uh, bike trail at Rockwood or something. It's, you know, it's rough area, and it has uh, boulders and, you know, kind of coming off. So it's not, it's not a really easy path to follow. So there are a lot of robbers. There's a lot of um, people on there, there that's, you know, out to rob and to steal from others and beat them up or whatever it takes. So as they go down, and I believe, if I remember correctly, Jericho is actually below sea level. So that gives you some indication of how far, not just in coming down, but how far you're coming. So just to give you an idea of what it's like, there it was, Brian. Mm -hmm. I would say that it could be some of each since they had Israelites as, um, if you want to say, a half-parent. Uh, but at the same time, I know that some of them were not. They were pagan worshipers. So only making a historical guess, I would say there was probably some of each. Pastor Ron? Jericho is the next time, next uh, two weeks. It's, uh, um, there's a lot in there, but basically some, some have kept their identity, uh, some have kept their culture, but some have lost the language uh, in there. Uh, so there's, there's similarities, but there's some difference. But I don't think there's overt difference. I think it's the identity, the culture uh, that stands out. Yeah. I think so too. And uh, I was trying, just off the top of my head, what was that exile? Was it 70 years, 70, 80 years? I'm not sure, I get so confused. You know, the, the Israelites were exiled so many times that I kind of forget, but there, it was more than like, what generation is 10 years, you know, 10 years, 10 years, 10 years. So I know that it went through more than two or three generations. So you remember that even the Israelites themselves they were different. They were different. It's just, you know, it's like, how can I, you go to different churches of the brother and you're going to have some different things. You should have the main, main theories and the main thoughts should be there, but you're going to have some different ways of worship, just some different ways that they do things. 
And I'm sure in the Israelites, that's just the way we people roll, is that things a bit and so forth. So some are and some aren't, but it would be different than the Israelites probably that are coming back in because they seem to maintain their culture, even though they were in exile. The, the reason I ask that question, Barb, is, Sorry. Is, is, is the parallels. You know, I look at the Good Samaritan and how God uses people. And then we look at today, you know, and, and for instance, we have different people of, of different faiths, uh, and they don't necessarily worship. So a lot of times, even though we have some similar beliefs, we shy away from them. Samaritan just would say, you got somebody here that's hurting, and God uses him, and a lot of the Jews just, you know, they wouldn't give him the time of day, but he did God's work. And a lot yeah. of times, we don't do God's work, and we claim that we are Christians. Well, that's the whole point. Why? A lesson is a good lesson. But culturally today, I see a uh, shift. Well, it has been going on, but I shift between secularism and paganism. Oh, uh, paganism yes. Is what's going on because there are people that believe, well, so long as you, you, know, you can believe what you believe, right? Uh, but don't bring Jesus into it. You know, you can believe in God. I had that in stereo weeks. I had that when I worked part time. Right. They, yeah, so when I first, a couple of years, it wasn't like that. But all of a sudden they said, well, would you just please remember, don't pray in Jesus' name. And I'd say, well, you know, you're asking me something that, you know, you really can't do. And what's your, so we had a conversation about it. I said, well, that, see, that's where it's at. If you, as long as you, you can believe in God, but when it comes down to what God you believe in, see, it's more of the, but it's the Jesus only. Putting words yeah. out there. Yeah. So I wasn't disrespectful in that. He said, well, you know, we're, we're asked to do these. Yeah. So that's kind of some of that. People are not offended who believe, oh, yeah, you believe in God. But when you go down, Jesus is the only, right? Then it becomes a little different. Yeah, I think when you get to the blood and the crucifixion, because that's what Jesus represents, David. I don't know that there maybe, I want to say that there wouldn't have been the percentage there is now, maybe just to make myself feel good. You know, you, you're talking about a culture. If you look at 1970, you're looking at a culture that had just come through, uh, was still coming through the Vietnam War, uh, just coming off of uh, really still in the hippie generation. I can tell you this because in 1970, I graduated from high school. So 50 years ago, okay, 50 years ago. When I went with Maddie to Cal U to... The point would be, I just graduated in 70. Nah, he's younger than me. 
But at that same time, there was a lot of things changing. You know, God wasn't important anymore. I, I'm just saying. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, let, let me, yeah, God is dead. I remember those placards. Oh, okay. <laughs> the thing. Okay. <laughs> It's hard to teach your peers, let me tell you. But remember, I'm used to teenagers, so okay. I think it's always been that way. Um, you think about it, just the changes in, we'll pick on the 60s because Okay, you know, I grew up in that time period, and I watched the, the, the changes. Think about taking um, prayer and Bible reading out of school in the 60s. I want to say 62, 63. I always get the year wrong. Jim corrects me. So uh, I think that's when it was, taken out of um, school. And that... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I have to go back and I need to make notes now. I'm getting so old and forgetful. <laughs> but a lot of things changed. It, go back into the 40s, real quick here. Go back into the 40s. Mom was home with an apron and, and a shirt, what, shirt waist dress. You know, she was cooking in the kitchen. She was dusting. She was cleaning, taking the kids, doing whatever it was. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just trying to help you understand what's going on. You're in the 40s, after the World War, okay? Things start to get back to home and family. War's over. So, dad works, mom's at home. Somebody's there with the kids all the time, you know. Going to church was still important. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, Spock and uh, more Freud and uh, so forth. You talk about changing times. Oh. They could rip, rip those chapters out of the book. Um, but to say that things change, they do. You go from the 40s, then you get to the 50s. Then different times, right? I mean, you look at the changes in the music, you look at the changes in the hairstyles, you look at the changes in the cars, the family situations. 50s, then you push right into the 60s. Well, that's the thing. Not all negative, but to help David with his question to say, yes, church and family, God, church, family, became less. Every, every 10 years, every generation, I'm going to go... Uh, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. We aren't even going to go back into the 1800s because that's when God was everything. Church was everything. There wasn't anything to give church um, anything else. That was your social life. That was your culture. That was everything. That was everything. Then as time moved forward, and it's fast forward to the 60s, man, you had it all going on. The music, the drugs... The, um, well, I was going to say sex, but free love is a nice way to say it, but we don't have any little kids, so that's okay. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, it, there is nothing free, but to get back... It was the free love, the, the flower children. Yeah. And uh, you think about it. I have a really bad time dealing with an issue within our family unit. 
and that's um, the um, idea that it's okay to do an abortion. Now, I have all kinds of issues, but to say how things have changed, David, in 1970, I started Cal U at June the 3rd, and uh, the birth control pill had just come out. You know, it was a big thing, 68 into 70. You're going to say, well, what is she going on for? Listen, it meant that, first of all, people could be more sexually active, which under the guidance of God, under the guidance of the Bible and our uh, moral and ethic code within a church, that is not acceptable. Um, the idea of having an abortion as a form of uh, birth control really bothers me. And of course, Maddie's going into social work. We'll pick on her. She's not here today. <laughs> Don't tell her, okay? No, the thing is, and I, I just use her because there's so much of this out there that it's okay to do abortions. And it's just personally for me, it is a form. It's murder. It's just that simple. But I try to teach these young people people, especially girls, they, they really are fired up over this right now. Just to show you how things have changed, if you go from 1940, 1950 to 2020, it, it's just, there's, there isn't even any thought there. It's just a quick decision, let's go get it done. I try to teach them, instead of making that quick decision, yes, you made a mistake, you're not forever going to have to pay for that. Go back, try to get adoption laws made easier and better rather than having an abortion, find someone to adopt that child. Get the abortion laws, that's fine. What we need is better adoption laws. Make it easier, make it easier. I have a lot of friends. They go to Africa, they go to China, to get a child because they can't get one here in the United States. So while we are doing our anti-abortion thing, that's okay, but let's make sure there are other alternatives out there, okay? Because there are families that really want children and they can't get them, they can't get them. And yet there are other people I even forget the number of abortions that are done daily and, and within the year. It, it, it sickens me, okay? And I don't want to dwell on that. So the idea, if you want to pull all that into loving your neighbor, is simply this. Work on these politicians to get adoption laws. That's what we need, better adoption laws. A lot of... Oh, I know that, James T. Greed, greed is what's driven our whole country to where we're at now. Well, because we lost all our morals and all our ethics. Right. And, and when lawyers can make tens of thousands of dollars on a donkey. Absolutely. That's wrong. I agree. And I mean, and it's a form of human trafficking. And, and people can say, I'm crazy, whatever you want to say, but I'm telling you, adoption. It's like buying and selling, high or bitter. That's a nice way to put it.
What is society? Because we're part of society. And I agree with you that we should be putting the word out there. I don't have an issue with that. I don't have an issue with talking to anyone about Christ. That's so important. That's the bottom line. But, you know, I'm going to have to play devil's advocate. I mean, I've taught my grandchildren. I have seven of them all about Christ. I've taught my children, Jim and I both. I don't know for any of you grandparents, parents, whatever. I, Madigan, am, again, I'm picking on her, but <laughs> she's online because Cal U's not having, you know, nobody there. No one's there. Now, sometimes when I'm there with her, you know, it's, it's FaceTime with the professor. So you, you get to hear the professor. They're right there, and she's, uh, you know. And I listen. David, I listened to what, at what I already knew was being taught. So everything that you teach your children and your grandchildren and your friends and your neighbors, your loved ones, we need to keep that up. Love your neighbor in a way that you are giving them the truth. But you just remember one thing. For every time you talk to them, somebody else is out there talking to them totally opposite. So we can't just put the seed in the ground and not keep maintaining it, watering it, and keeping it going. Because there is one of her professors that's about my age, I think, and she has a whole lot different perspective on life. Because Matt's in social work. She's got all these, you know, save the world classes and uh, save the children. And I'm just being facetious about that. But I hear what some of them are teaching. And I knew this. I mean, I knew this before. I, knew, I, I preached to all my grandchildren, all the students. You're going to hear things that aren't right. But if you want your degree, you have to go to that class. You have to pass it so that you can get those letters behind your name so that you can make a difference. You know? You, the reality is you can make a difference but you also have to do some of the things that you don't agree with. And that's another thing. I tell my students, and, and Faye and Judy and Michelle, those of you who have been in my class for a long time, you know how it is. We all agree. Professors are pathetic. College is pathetic. Remember, I'm a teacher. I, I Not just here, know. but in the room. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, Everything that the Christian world is putting out there is being undermined all the time. If you think the devil's sleeping, you better get awake real fast. Well, you know, when we look at the Good Samaritan, we look at what Jesus, you looked at the very beginning, the, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees. We as Christians, though, cannot take, we do not have the luxury of being offended because even Jesus, but we are offensive to the world. <laughs> and blamed for that, by the way. Every day by the Pharisees and the Sad. He was challenged with the, the, the thought process and of the chosen people. So I, I, I totally get it. You know, again, with, with our children, the different generations and, and, and aspects. But we also have to adjust ourselves. We were talking about the 60s and sort of reminiscing. By the way, I graduated in 70. So, you know, I'm very <laughs> A little behind me, huh? <laughs> But that's the really important part of this Samaritan story. They didn't go up there preaching to him. They went there with love, caring. Not only did the guy fix him up on the road there, he took him to 
a hotel and inn back then, paid in advance for his care, his food, and came back and checked on him. That's what the whole lesson is about. What I'm saying is also when we do those kind of things, when we love people, when we really love them through Christ, from a distance, Pastor Ron. <laughs> I like that song. Anyway, the thing is, Well, this is the kind of lesson that has a whole lot of ramifications. First of all, you have to really know who the Pharisees and the Sadducees are. I mean, really have to know their background. You know, that's just, that was my thing, you know. The other thing is, there's a lot here. There's a lot here. But the point is, David, Brian, everybody else, yes, we must approach them in Christian love. Not just once, maybe for one person. Maybe we only get that chance once. I don't know. Did you ever go down the road and there's a wreck? Or somebody has a, 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 the, the vehicle stopped, you don't know them. And you say, you know, you wind the window down a little and you say, can I help you? Can I make a phone call? You know, what can I do? Now, the world also teaches us that we shouldn't get involved. I'm not going to go into that one, but... The <laughs> Another time, another day, but that's, that's the thing. Understand that what we have as a Christian community is very scary to other people because they don't want involved. They're all about themselves. I'm telling you, whether you believe me, I don't care. It's just the way it is. The Bible tells you that. It tells you that, that those people that are self-centered do not have the love of Christ in their heart. So the world tells you it's okay to be there just for you, you know. And you see it in advertisements and on TV shows and in the music. And what am I missing? All kinds of stuff. Because that's what they want you to think. They want you to think, A, you're not worthy, you know. That's a big, big thing. You know, you're not perfect. You don't use this kind of hairspray. You don't use that kind of body wash. You don't use this. And I could go on, but I don't, we don't have time. The thing is, is they teach you that. They go around. They say us Christians are, um, we Christians are narrow-minded. We don't want to be like them. So they say that we're, you know, segregationist, I guess, that we, we, they don't, you know, we're too hard line. Now they put it in all kinds of words, but you are all older and you understand that language, so I just use it. But that's what they do, you know. They try to make you feel like you're the one with all the issues. Do we have issues? Certainly, because we are a body of people. Human beings. Human beings has, they ha we all have them. We have some flaws. Ask Jim, he can tell you all mine. <laughs> That's why he can't come today. <laughs> no. No, no. Uh, the thing is, is the bottom line. You know, in the teacher's books, they give you a little thing at the beginning of each lesson. It's really nice. We have about two minutes. And, and the ones for this lesson was about um, the neighborhood, you know, the neighborhood. And you, you look at it and you think, well, what is really our neighborhood, you know? Where did we come from and, and who are we? And what can we do? You know, Mr. Rogers, I don't know how many of you knew he was a Presbyterian minister. Yeah, okay. And he would take his little uh, group around to see all kinds of people of all faiths and all colors and all uh, workmen of all kinds because he wanted kids not to be afraid of people that were different. And we have to be careful of that too. But we have to be open to Christianity. But we have to be open to Christianity ourselves. We really do. We have to really renew our faith in Christ because the world 
And when I say the world, I don't want you to get that weirdo picture in your mind. I'm talking about everything that we deal with on a daily basis, whatever it is, literature, TV, music, people, you know. Hester, Ron, did you want to say something? Yeah. Well, the culture that we live in today is very narcissistic. You know, it's all about me. And they teach that. I mean, you don't think that. I mean, they're not going to come out and say, well, I'm going to teach narcissism today. But it is where we're at. Uh, that's it for the time period. Everybody have a really blessed day and, you know, just have a really great week. Thank you.